when you've got the yeah, game is useful already it's reminded if you've got two resistors in parallel say they're both genome resistors now uh, if we work that one out um, 1 over uh, t equals 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10 which is equal to 2 tenths so um, we flip it up the other way to get uh, to, uh, to 1 over rt total equals 2 over 10 uh, total we call 10 over 2 flip it back the other way which is 5 so there's an important lesson <laughs> um, when you put two resistors in parallel that are the same resistance the answer the total resistance is half okay so 10 ohm and a 10 ohm in parallel you don't have to do the maths it's 5 ohms and you can kind of see without going into the maths that makes sense because the current has got an easier path to flow hasn't it when the current flows into the circuit some of it will go down there it'll be the same the resistors are the same aren't they so the same amount will flow through there as flows through there and um, and the answer is, is one half. So a 20 ohm and a 20 ohm in parallel is 10 ohms. It's, it's half, the, the total resistance is half of each one on its own because the current, you're getting twi effectively got twice the current flowing into the circuit with the same voltage. And if you work it out from Ohm's law, you'll get, the answer will be half the resistance. And it's, if you've got more than, um, well, imagine there's a whole lot more and then there's a number 10 up here. 1, 2, 10. The question was, what if you've got 10 10 ohm resistors? Three, one. It was 1, yeah, it's quite right. Yeah, yeah. Joshua just said 1. It's, um, if all the resistors are the same, you just divide up the answer by the, the, the individual resistor by that number. So if you've got um, 5 resistors of the same, it's 1 fifth of each one on its own. If you've got 10, it's 1 tenth. And that's that question there. Um, question 17. 10 resistors of equal value R are wired in parallel. The total resistance is A, R, well no, it's not the same as 1. 10 R, no, it's 10, 10 times. If it was in series, it would be 10 times. And um, 10 over R, or R over 10, R divided by 10. In other words, 1 tenth, which is the correct answer, which is D, R over 10. All right here. Yeah, I see there was still one more. You guys got the hang of resistors in parallel? That's yeah, that's cool. Be yeah. Okie dokie. Here's, here's a good question. Um, a simple transmitter requires a 50 ohm dummy load. In other words, a 50 ohm resistor. Okay. And if they want to know how you can make one, four 300 ohm resistors in parallel, what's 300 divided by four? That's 150 divided by, it's uh, half of it and halving it again, so that'd be 75 ohms. No. Five 300 ohm resistors in parallel. What's 300 divided by five? 60. Yep, it's, no, it's not 50, we want 50 ohms. No. Okay. Six 300 ohm resistors in parallel. That's only a bit more promising, isn't it? 300 divided by six equals 50 this is question 29 yep for 300 three uh, uh, six 300 ohm resistors and another four in the middle uh, 300 ohms in parallel will look just like 50 ohms and uh, yeah the question D was uh, seven 300 divided by seven now that's less than 50 isn't it uh, um, so while we're on the subject of resistor I'll just, um, there you go. This is a uh, 50 ohm resistor, exactly what they're talking about before. It's got a little plug on the end, we'll remove that. It's got an adapter on there. They're talking about something for testing a transmitter before, a 50 ohm load. That's what this is here. And um, what's inside this solid chunk of aluminium, there'll be a little block of carbon in there, and it's connected from that little pin on the inside to those ones on the outside wired across it. You know we have these terminals in our drawing, well that's the terminals there and that's a 50 ohm resistor in there and this is used for testing transmitters. If you want, most of our transmitters produce um, uh, a design to be connected 
to a, what's called a 50 ohm load. Our aerials and everything are designed to look like a 50 ohm resistor as far as the radio is concerned to send the power into. So that's got a big resistance in there. You can feel how heavy that is. And that's designed to take quite a bit of power. See how it's got the cooling fins on there? We'll come on to power in a, in a, in a minute. That's our um, next thing. So that's one form of resistor. Oops, crash bang. Righty ho. Just yellow. Yeah, right, those two. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay. So just a, a few different kinds of resistor. That's um, one we showed in the last week's one where we measured the resistance in you know, on a circuit. Mm -hmm. Can you see that in there? No, I don't know. Okay. This is a, it's a, got 40 ohms written on the side. This one's designed to operate in a circuit where it might get quite hot. There's enough current flowing through it to do, a, do enough work. Okay. Now inside here, you see that Joshua? Yep. You see those little fellas there with the coloured bands? Now on page six of the basic training manual it tells you how to work out what the number of the how many ohms the resistor is from the color code. So you can see the colored bands there. Can you see that one there? Yep. 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 That, um, this one's a bit larger. It's designed to um, handle a bit more power. As I said we're coming on to power calculations in just a minute. Here's another one over here. This is probably a, a wire wound resistor. These ones are made with carbon inside them and they mix the carbon differently in different uh, mixtures to get the resistance right. This one here, that one's a, a five designed to handle about five watts of power. And um, these little fellows are just about a quarter of a watt. These are about two watts. And this one's got it written on the side. Uh, uh, 25 watts. It can get quite hot. There's about as much, much heat as what a soldering iron produces. So we'll just draw on the board what we're going to talk about next, which are variable resistors. Can you see that there? Yep, Jeff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry about this at home. <laughs> these are resistors that you can adjust. And you see these are the sorts of things you have in front panels of stereos and, uh, and other bits and pieces. Come in different sizes. There's two of them hooked together. Often in, in, in a stereo you want to be able to control the left volume and the right volume at the same time, so they hook them together. Here's a little miniature one here. This one's got a little uh, gearing arrangement. Can you see that there? Yeah, you're going sort of high and sort of it. it takes about 10 turns to go from one end to the other. That's so you can got precise adjustment of, of the resistance amount. It's an adjustable one. Here's one that you have in stereo as they've got remote controls and you hit, hit the up and down button on the volume and the volume control goes around on its own. It's got a little motor in there, a little gearbox just to drive the, um, the resistor shaft around there. Right, hey. Wasn't too. Did you get most of it on there? Yeah, probably one or two parts where it just goes out. Yeah. And then it came back. Yeah, get So, just talking about different types of resistor, here's one I just showed you up close. It's called a variable resistor. And it's in that. Uh, just flick over a page or two. There it is here, page eight in the basic radio training manual. This is where we. Most of the resistors we use are, are, are fixed in, in value. In other words, they're, they're, uh, they've got the resistance in ohms and color codes on it, and that's what it is, and that's what it stays. Sometimes we want to have an adjustable resistor, and what these things have is a, a track of a carbon material with connections. There's three connections there, one, two, three, one, two, three. One's at one end of the carbon track, one's at the other, and the other is connected onto a wiper, a conductive thing that moves around. So you can see when it's at, the wiper's at this end here, the actual resistance between here and here is quite small. See, so current can go in just a little way around the carbon resistance material and out. But if you use this end in here, it's quite a lot. And as you get around, it's halfway, it's equal both sides, and then it's less at this end and, and most at the other. And they're used in things like volume controls and radio, where you want to um, just uh, pick off a little bit of the voltage to have a, have a, you have a, a signal connected across the resistor and you can adjust 
the full signal voltage coming in, say from a microphone or a radio or something like that, we go the other end and you have the maximum. Sometimes you want to, um, I'll just draw the circuit, might make it a little bit easier. A battery. Now this is a symbol for a, uh, that's a standard resistor. Well, remember there's that rectangular box as well, which I don't tend to use. And a variable resistor, you put a little arrow on there. Okay, say if we had a circuit that we want to adjust how much voltage is going into it. And um, there's quite a lot of applications where you might want to do that. So when you turn the wiper one way, right round to that end there, you've got the full battery voltage coming out the other end. See how it's connected right across the whole circuit? When it's connected right down near the bottom, well if it's in the middle, it's, uh, you've now got when you've got two resistors and you're at the halfway point, then it's half. So now you've got half the battery voltage there. And if you keep on winding it down, you get down to almost nothing and then finally zero as it hits the other end of the track. So you've now got say, a 12 volt battery. You can adjust using this here from nothing right up to about 12 volts. And there are circuits where you might want to do that. So that's why I have, have adjustable ones. Add it back to my collection there. This gadget here, out of interest, is, is now is now a, re a retired um, from service. It, it was a power supply out of a telephone system that used to operate in the Marlborough Sounds on the uh, 1500 megahertz, 1 1.5 gigahertz. Remember the units last week? <laughs> and um, you feed to it plugged in. It was kind of in a, a semi outdoors enclosure with this bolted and tight around a rubber gasket. This is a heat sink to get rid of extra heat from the electronics. You feed 230 volts AC into it and got about 12 volts direct current out of it for supplying the electronics in the, uh, in the phone system that was providing phone service to remote bays and things like that around the Marlborough Sounds. So, you said it had megahertz. Oh, that, that, that there is um, it was supplying, Josh was just asking about the megahertz, it was supplying power to an electronic and radio system that produced signals up around about 1500 megahertz. That didn't actually do the producer signal. It but just... It was for a phone? It was for a phone system, yeah. So it used radio as well, didn't it? Yep. I'll tell you about that later, actually, yeah. All right. So I think we've probably done... Any questions on resistance? Probably done it to death now, haven't we? <laughs> okay. What's next? Um, power calculations. Pause here for editing. Right, let's get my material together. Now, yeah, power is kind of a measure of doing work, okay? And that's what you see applied to a light bulb, you know, like a 60 watt bulb or a 100 watt bulb or a 200 watt bulb. The power is, um, is a, as I said, is doing work and it's measured in watts. And as I said, it's, it could be electrical work, so a light bulb's got 200, uh, say a, a 150 watt bulb or something like that. It tends, it's brighter than a 50 watt bulb, it's more heat being produced, more energy. Um, you know the power output of car engines is measured in? Used to be horsepower, and now it's kilowatts. You, you watch a Ford Falcon advert, and they're talking about their V8, and it might be 250 kilowatt engine or something. So that, that's work. A motor is doing work when it's pushing a car along, so you measure that in watts as well. And um, now in radio circuitry, if um, we had a 12 volt battery here before, our old friend, <laughs> with a uh, 6 ohm load on there. Now the current flowing in the circuit is I is equal to V over R, 12 over 6 is 2 amps. Now to work out how much electrical work's been done in here by this resistor, this resistor will get warm, okay, sometimes it gets quite hot. You see this little fellow here, it's got designed to get hot, it's in an aluminium enclosure and it can be bolted to a heat sink. Um, that which is a chunk about that black thing on the other power supply there. The power of watts that that resistor is producing 
is equal to the current flowing through it multiplied by the voltage across it. Okay, so power is equal to volts times amps, which is on, which is, you find it in the book for us, which is uh, 6 times 2, which is equal to 6 times, uh, no it's not, sorry, it's uh, 2 times 12. We'll keep it the same as what's above it, 12 volts times 2 amps, which is equal to 24 watts. That's how much power one word is dissipating or being produced by or whatever. That's how that, that's the amount of energy that is, is uh, work is being done in that resistor. That's so that's quite a lot actually. Um, if you just put a little resistor in there, one of those little quarter watt fellas in there, it's not designed to get rid of the heat. They'll go up and smoke quick, and they'll often go red hot and break. You, uh, that's the reason we're out of heat. Your average um, Dick Smith soldering iron or whatever produces about 24 watts, or that's how much uh, heat is produced by the heating element, and that will heat it up the tip and up to about 300 degrees, which is enough to melt solder. Okay, so um, power being consumed in a circuit or being produced in a, by a circuit or released by a light bulb or a resistor is equal to voltage across it times the current flowing through it. Make sense? Now, we, we can measure it other ways um, or work it out. Um, remember that V is equal to I times R, isn't it? Okay. We also said that power is equal to volts times current, the voltage across it times the current flowing through it. Um, if we didn't actually know what the voltage in the circuit is, let's say we didn't know what um, voltage was being applied, we all we knew, knew that we could measure it, say the battery didn't have a label on it, we didn't have a voltmeter, but we could measure the current, we knew it was 2 amps flowing into a 6 ohm resistor. Well it, we can work it out here, okay well look, power is equal to volts times amps, right? We also know that um, voltage is equal to I times R. So what we can actually do is take that I times R and stick it where the volts was. Okay. Let's say we don't know what the voltage is. We know I and R, like the current and the resistance, but we want to work out the power. We want to work out the power being produced by that, used by that resistor when we don't, when we don't know the voltage. So we can take the V out of there. Okay. We know the power is equal to volts times amps, and we can put the I times R. I times I. That's equal to volts, isn't it? V equals I times R. So power is equal to the resistance times the current times the current. Does that make sense? That's equal to 6 times 2 times 2. 6 times 2 is 12 times 2 is 24 watts, which is what we worked out before. Now when you've got something times itself, P is equal to R times I times I. What's I times I? That's I, I squared. squared, okay? So power is equal to R times I squared or I squared R. Now that's, there is, right. So that's an important calculation. I squared R, you hear that a lot if you're doing any electrical calculations or so on. The power uh, being used by a circuit is equal to I squared R. It's I, the current times the current times the resistance. The current flowing through the resistance times itself times the, uh, the number of ohms of the resistor. Now in the, um, it's not laid out so well in the basic radio training manual, but in the, uh, on the NZART website, in the question element 7 under power calculations, there's a nice little circular diagram that lays out all the various power calculations, and that's an important one, I squared R. And when power companies are talking about how much power they're losing in their transmission lines, now when, when you're talking about power being measured by, consumed by a circuit, if you've got a battery, that could be a power station, it doesn't have to be a battery, you've got your conductors, they could be power along power pylons going from one end of the country to the other, and the resistor may be Auckland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, the, the calculations, it could be a city because you talk about uh, how much power is being produced by a power station. 
might be, um, say, the Manapuri power station down in um, Fiordland can, now that they've fixed it, modified it a bit, can produce 700 megawatts. It can supply to a resistor 700 million watts. That's its capacity. It's quite a bit, isn't it? Okay, that's a that's quite a lot. Now, just just a little aside about power calculations. We assume that these conductors are perfect when we talk about in circuit. There's no resistance there. Then we've got our resistor and so on. When when that load is like a large city and these are power pylons going from one end of the country to the other, these conductors have actually got a bit of resistance, haven't they? And the um, the amount of power being lost in the conductors going from one place to another, they talk about I squared R losses. In other words, the current flowing through them times uh, the resistance of the conductor is, is what's been lost along the... Um, doesn't matter what the voltage is, we're only interested in the current flowing through it as I squared R losses. It's just a bit of an aside. Right, we'll just go back to the other one. Just So power is equal to volts times amps is equal to I squared R, and there's one other one we can do. We'll go back to our finally back to revisit our, our battery. 12 volt battery. Uh, what did we use before? We used a 6 ohm load or a 6 ohm resistance. What was the current? I is equal to V over R, 2 amps, 12 divided by 6. Now using that one there, it's volts times amps, which is 12 times 2, which is equal to 24. Using this formula here, I squared R, uh, 2 times 2 times 6, which is equal to 2 times 2 is 4 times 6 is 24 watts. Now there's one more way we can do it. What if we don't know the voltage, uh, sorry, what if we know the voltage of the battery, but we haven't got a current meter and we don't know how much current's flowing in there? Now, <laughs> yeah, we can get a multimeter. <laughs> Thank you, that's very useful. <laughs> What's um, voltage in the circuit is equal to? Uh, v, um, v is equal to now uh, V. It was our thing, wasn't it? Okay. Volt. Um, what if we? Uh, yeah, we didn't know the current. Okay. V is equal. I's current is equal to volts divided by resistance, isn't it? Okay. So it's equal to the. Um, Hang on, V times I. Um, we, um, we don't know the current, so we're going to put the current calculation into this. So it's equal to volts times, now I is equal to V over R times V over R, isn't it? So power is also equal to volts times voltage over resistance. Now, that's the same as saying V times V divided by R. Now what's V times V? V squared. V squared. So power is also equal to V squared over R. So what's the voltage? 12. What's 12 times 12? 144. <laughs> it's equal to 144 divided by 6. What's 144 divided? Do you want to do on the calculator to make sure? 24. Yeah, if you see a pattern emerging, you can answer this without having to do the calculation. It's 24. Yeah, 24. There you go. There's three formulae for working out. If you know the voltage and the current, you can work it out. Voltage times I, V times I. If you don't know the voltage being applied, but you know current and the resistance of the load, see this one, you don't know the resistance of the load. We just know the current and the voltage, the current flowing, the voltage applied. If we don't know the voltage, it's I squared R, and if we know, don't know the current, it's V squared over R. All of them will give you the same answer. It's all just using Ohm's law put back into that power calculation. So if you do much electrical calculations, you very quickly get those memorised. You don't ever forget them again. Um, v squared over R. When the, um, remember I talked about power companies are interested in how much power they're losing in the conductors. There's Auckland. We'll keep it in the South Island, we'll call it Benham. <laughs> There's the conductors here. They talk about their I squared R losses in the, in the conductor. The other thing, the other losses they can get, which isn't, aren't as significant, but on the high voltage DC line that goes down the world pass there, you know, the one with two conductors on it, 
you've got um, on a on a power pylon. If you look at in cross section, you've got your conductors there, and you've got those insulators hanging the wires. You know, the insulators. Now, some current, although they're made of porcelain and fired glass, you know, whatever, some current does actually flow through them to the other conductor. It's not much, but it's, it's a tiny amount. They're not perfect insulators. A little bit of current leaks through them, okay? But don't the wires have plastic something around themselves? Oh, these are very high voltage wires. They they, these are about three, no, they're bare. Three, 375 kilovolts on one side and 250 kilovolts on the other. And they're big, long insulator strings. But there's, you know, made of a whole lot of sections to get a lot of gap between them, a lot of insulating material. A little bit of current does flow through them, not much. So we can actually, there's our load there, say a city. So there are, between Lake Benmore and down in Otago, and up the top of the country here before it goes under the Cook Strait Cable, you've got a few thousand ceramic insulators in parallel. Can you see it's kind of between the conductors? Now, it adds up. Um, a little bit of current leaks through every single one. So the power company does lose a, a bit of current, a bit of power into their insulators, and they call that V squared over R losses because it's a voltage across the resistance. Um, just just a, a, a little aside, I want to try and make the thing a bit more interesting. OK, I think that's uh, power calculations. You can just have a look and see how much time is left on it. Just want to hit stop for it? Oh, that's good. I'll get you to hit the stop button. Hit, just hit that red button again when it will stop. Right, um, alternating current. So that's um, the eighth section of in the uh, the um, online study guide, and um, starts on page 12, the basic radio training manual. AC is alternating current. Up until now, we've been dealing with DC, direct current, in our Ohm's law calculations and so on. A direct current supply is the current you get off your ordinary battery, cell, collection of cells forming a battery, whatever. Um, the minus terminal and the plus terminal remain that way the whole time. They uh, don't change. Um, the voltage more or less stays the same. Of course, it will drop slightly as, as, the, as the battery uh, goes flat. But when you connect a load on, a resistance, flow of electrons will go around the circuit in one direction and remain going in that direction. That's what we mean by direct current. And uh, electronic equipment, well, it may, some of them may plug into the alternating current supply from the mains out of a plug outlet. Internally, all the electronic equipment is running off DC or direct current. And a lot of our amateur equipment, well, most of it these days, will run off, will, will, runs off a 12 volt. Uh, direct current supply which would get off a power supply from the mains or from a, from a battery. Now alternating current is quite different from direct current. Um, I think a good example is what we get out of a three pin plug on the wall. We've got three holes in the socket, a phase and a neutral and an earth. Now we won't be worried exactly about what phase and neutral mean at the moment. We can come on to that later when we talk about power supplies. We can forget about the earth terminal. The actual energy is supplied by these two terminals here from phase and, ne and neutral. What I mean by alternating current is that for part of the time one terminal will be plus, the other will be minus, and then a time later they swap over. That one becomes plus, that one becomes minus, and they swap back, they alternate. It's going plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And we'll draw a picture of what that looks like in a graph in just a moment. Um, I think it'd be a good point to cover now is why why do we bother about alternating current when our electronic equipment needs to run off a direct current supply? Well, there's two good reasons for them. One one is the the main supply. What I mean by that is is our power supply that comes out of a three-pin plug from a cable under the ground or up in the air on the street. 
from a transformer down the road uh, and ultimately from a substation and a power station somewhere remote. Uh, alternating current is used in, the in our electricity supply because it allows us to easily go through devices called transformers which we'll cover soon to step the voltage up and down and so on. That can be done easily with alternating current. You can't do it with direct current. So uh, alternating current is used for uh, the bulk supply of electrical energy. That's really the only way to do it. There are some special cases like the Inter Island Cook Strait DC line. That's done for quite specific reasons in that you can't put alternating current down and through undersea cables. We won't, won't go into that, but that's. But basically, it's 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 used for uh, the, as I said, the bulk supply of electrical energy. The other reason is uh, in radio. We're very interested in alternating current because it's the only way that we can get our aerials to radiate signals to go across town, uh, uh, across this room in the form of a wireless microphone or um, around the world or to communicate with distant space probes is by supplying an alternating current supply to an antenna, an aerial of some sort. Um, the only way you'll get a wire or a piece of uh, metal or something acting as an aerial to radiate is to actually have an alternating current flowing through it. Direct current just won't radiate a, a radio signal. I think um, we can just show first, there's a nice picture on the front page of the study guide. It's the, uh, the eighth, eighth one in the series off the website. It just shows you how you can generate an alternating current um, voltage. And uh, that's done with a uh, a tube of some sort, you could do it with a toilet roll or something like that, some wire around, around the outside of it, a number of turns. And um, connect that up to a, a meter. They actually show a thing called a centre zero meter, what that means is that 